Kerfol, House of Madness, Part 2. Well, to go back. The very year after the little brown dog was brought to Kerfol, Yves de Corneau, one winter night, was found dead at the head of a narrow flight of stairs leading down from his wife's rooms to a door opening on the court. It was his wife who found him and gave the alarm, so distracted the poor wretch with fear and horror, for his blood was all over her, that at first the roused household could not make out what she was saying, and thought she had suddenly gone mad. But there, sure enough, at the top of the stairs lay her husband, stone dead and head foremost, the blood from his wounds dripping down to the step below him. He had been dreadfully scratched and gashed about the face and throat, as if with curious pointed weapons, and one of his legs had a deep tear in it which had cut an artery and probably caused his death. But how did he come there, and who had murdered him? His wife declared that she had been asleep in her bed, and hearing his cry had rushed out to find him lying on the stairs, but this was immediately questioned. In the first place, it was proved that from her room she could not have heard the struggle on the stairs, owing to the thickness of the walls and the length of the intervening passage. Then it was evident that she had not been in bed and asleep, since she was dressed when she roused the house, and her bed had not been slept in. Moreover, the door at the bottom of the stairs was ajar, and it was noticed by the chaplain, an observant man, that the dress she wore was stained with blood about the knees, and that there were traces of small blood-stained hands low down on the staircase walls, so that it was conjectured that she had really been at the postern door when her husband fell, and, feeling her way up to him in the darkness on her hands and knees, had been stained by his blood dripping down on her. Of course, it was argued on the other side that the blood marks on her dress might have been caused by her kneeling down by her husband when she rushed out of her room, but there was the open door below, and the fact that the finger marks in the staircase all pointed upward. The accused held to her statement for the first two days in spite of its improbability, but on the third day word was brought to her that Hervé de Lanrivain, a young nobleman of the neighbourhood, had been arrested for complicity in the crime. Two or three witnesses thereupon came forward to say that it was known throughout the country that Lanrivain had formerly been on good terms with the Lady of Cornault, but that he had been absent from Brittany for over a year, and people had ceased to associate their names. The witnesses who made this statement were not of a very reputable sort. One was an old herb-gatherer suspected of witchcraft, another a drunken clerk from a neighbouring parish, the third a half-witted shepherd who could be made to say anything— and it was clear that the prosecution was not satisfied with its case, and would have liked to find more proof of Lanrivain's complicity than the statement of the herb-gatherer, who swore to having seen him climbing the wall of the park on the night of the murder. One way of patching out incomplete proofs in those days was to put some sort of pressure, moral or physical, on the accused person. It is not clear what pressure was put on Anne de Cornon, but on the third day, when she was brought in court, she appeared weak and wandering, and after being encouraged to collect herself and speak the truth, on her honour and the wounds of her blessed Redeemer, she confessed that she had in fact gone down the stairs to speak with Hervé de Lanrivain, who denied everything, and had been surprised there by the sound of her husband's fall. That was better, and the prosecution rubbed its hands with satisfaction. The satisfaction increased when various dependents living at Kerfol were induced to say, with apparent sincerity, that during the year or two preceding his death, their master had once more grown uncertain and irascible, and subject to the fits of brooding silence which his household had learned to dread before his second marriage. This seemed to show that things had not been going well at Kerfol, though no one could be found to say that there had been any signs of open disagreement between husband and wife. Anne de Cornault, when questioned as to her reason for going down at night to open the door to Harvey de Lanrivain, made an answer which must have sent a smile around the court. She said it was because she was lonely and wanted to talk with the young man. Was this the only reason? she was asked, and replied, Yes, by the cross over your lordship's heads. But why at midnight? the court asked. Because I could see him in no other way. I can see the exchange of glances across the ermine collars under the crucifix. 
Anne de Cornon further questioned, said that her married life had been extremely lonely. Desolate was the word she used. It was true that her husband seldom spoke harshly to her, but there were days when he did not speak at all. It was true that he had never struck or threatened her, but he kept her like a prisoner at Kerfol, and when he rode away to Morlaix or Camper or Rennes, he set so close a watch on her that she could not pick a flower in the garden without having a waiting woman at her heels. "'I am no queen to need such honours," she once said to him, and he had answered that a man who has a treasure does not leave the key in the lock when he goes out. "'Then take me with you.' she urged, but to this he said that towns were pernicious places, and young wives better off at their firesides. "'But what did you want to say to Harvey de Lanrevin?' the court asked, and she answered, "'To ask him to take me away.' "'Ah, you confess that you went down to him with adulterous thoughts?' "'No.' "'Then why did you want him to take you away?' "'Because I was afraid for my life.' "'Of whom were you afraid?' of my husband. Why were you afraid of your husband? Because he had strangled my little dog. Another smile must have passed around the courtroom, in the days when any nobleman had a right to hang his peasants, and most of them exercised it. Pinching a pet animal's windpipe was nothing to make a fuss about. At this point one of the judges, who appears to have had a certain sympathy for the accused, suggested that she should be allowed to explain herself in her own way, and she thereupon made the following statement. The first years of her marriage had been lonely, but her husband had not been unkind to her. If she had had a child she would not have been unhappy, but the days were long and it rained too much. It was true that her husband, whenever he went away and left her, brought her a handsome present on his return, but this did not make up for the loneliness. At least nothing had, until he brought her the little brown dog from the east. After that she was much less unhappy. Her husband seemed pleased that she was so fond of the dog. He gave her leave to put her jewelled bracelet around its neck, and keep it always with her. One day she had fallen asleep in her room with the dog at her feet as his habit was. Her feet were bare and resting on his back. Suddenly she was waked by her husband. He stood beside her, smiling not unkindly. "'You look like my great-grandmother, Julienne de Cornon, lying in the chapel with her feet on a little dog,' he said. The analogy sent a chill through her, but she laughed and answered. Well, when I am dead, you must put me beside her, carved in marble, with my dog at my feet. Oh, we'll wait and see, he said, laughing also, but with his black brows close together. The dog is an emblem of fidelity. And do you doubt my right to lie with mine at my feet? When I'm in doubt, I find out, he answered. I am an old man, he added, and people say I make you lead a lonely life. But I swear you shall have your monument if you earn it. And I swear to be faithful, she returned, if only for the sake of having my little dog at my feet. Not long afterward he went on business to the Camper Assizes, and while he was away his aunt, the widow of a great nobleman of the duchy, came to spend a night at Kerfol on her way to the Pardon of Sainte Barbe. She was a woman of piety and consequence, and much respected by Yves de Cornault, and when she proposed to Anne to go with her to Sainte Barbe, no one could object, and even the chaplain declared himself in favour of the pilgrimage. So Anne set out for Sainte Barbe, and there for the first time she talked with Hervé de Lanrevin. He had come once or twice to Kerfol with his father, but she had never before exchanged a dozen words with him. They did not talk for more than five minutes now. It was under the chestnuts, as the procession was coming out of the chapel. He said, I pity you. And she was surprised, for she had not supposed that any one thought her an object of pity. He added, Call for me when you need me. And she smiled a little, but was glad afterward, and thought often of the meeting. She confessed to having seen him three times afterward, not more. How or where she would not say, one had the impression that she feared to implicate someone. Their meetings had been rare and brief, and at the last he had told her that he was starting the next day for a foreign country, on a mission which was not without peril, and might keep him for many months absent. He asked her for a remembrance, 
and she had none to give him but the collar about the little dog's neck. She was sorry afterward that she had given it, but he was so unhappy at going that she had not had the courage to refuse. Her husband was away at the time. When he returned a few days later, he picked up the animal to pet it, and noticed that its collar was missing. His wife told him that the dog had lost it in the undergrowth of the park, and that she and her maids had hunted a whole day for it. It was true, she explained to the court, that she had made the maids search for the necklet. They all believed the dog had lost it in the park. Her husband made no comment, and that evening at supper he was in his usual mood, between good and bad, you could never tell which. He talked a good deal, describing what he had seen and done at Rennes, but now and then he stopped and looked hard at her, and when she went to bed she found her little dog strangled on her pillow. The little thing was dead, but still warm. She stooped to lift it, and her distress turned to horror when she discovered that it had been strangled by twisting twice round its throat the necklet she had given to Lanrivain. The next morning at dawn she buried the dog in the garden and hid the necklet in her breast. She said nothing to her husband, then or later, and he said nothing to her, but that day he had a peasant hanged for stealing a faggot in the park, and the next day he nearly beat to death a young horse he was breaking. Winter set in, and the short days passed, and the long nights one by one, and she heard nothing of Hervé de Lanrivain. It might be that her husband had killed him, or merely that he had been robbed of the necklet. Day after day by the hearth among the spinning maids, night after night alone on her bed, she wandered and trembled. Sometimes at table her husband looked across at her and smiled, and then she felt sure that Lanrivain was dead. She dared not try to get news of him, for she was sure her husband would find out if she did. She had an idea that he could find out anything. Even when a witch-woman who was a noted seer, and could show you the whole world in her crystal, came to the castle for a night's shelter, and the maids flocked to her, Anne held back. The winter was long and black and rainy. One day, in Yves de Cornault's absence, some gypsies came to Kerfol with a troop of performing dogs. Anne bought the smallest and cleverest, a white dog with a feathery coat and one blue and one brown eye. It seemed to have been ill-treated by the gypsies, and clung to her plaintively when she took it from them. That evening her husband came back, and when she went to bed she found the dog strangled on her pillow. After that she said to herself that she would never have another dog, but one bitter cold evening a poor lean greyhound was found whining at the castle gate, and she took him in and forbade the maids to speak of him to her husband. She hid him in a room that no one went to, smuggled food to him from her own plate, made him a warm bed to lie on, and petted him like a child. Yves de Cornault came home, and the next day she found the greyhound strangled on her pillow. She wept in secret but said nothing, and resolved that even if she met a dog dying of hunger she would never bring him into the castle. But one day she found a young sheepdog, a brindled puppy with good blue eyes, lying with a broken leg in the snow of the park. Yves de Cornault was at Rennes, and she brought the dog in, warmed and fed it, tied up its leg and hid it in the castle, till her husband's return. The day before she gave it to a peasant woman who lived a long way off, and paid her handsomely to care for it and say nothing. But that night she heard a whining and scratching at her door, and when she opened it the lame puppy, drenched and shivering, jumped up on her with little sobbing barks. She hid him in her bed, and the next morning was about to have him taken back to the peasant woman when she heard her husband ride into the court. She shut the dog in a chest and went down to receive him. An hour or two later, when she returned to her room, the puppy lay strangled on her pillow. After that she dared not make a pet of any other dog, and her loneliness became almost unendurable. Sometimes, when she crossed the court of the castle and thought no one was looking, she stopped to pat the old pointer at the gate. But one day, as she was caressing him, her husband came out of the chapel, and the next day the old dog was gone. This curious narrative was not told in one sitting of the court, or received without impatience and incredulous comment. It was plain that the judges were surprised by its puerility, and that it did not help the accused in the eyes of the public. 
It was an odd tale, certainly, but what did it prove? That Yves de Corneau disliked dogs, and that his wife, to gratify her own fancy, persistently ignored this dislike. As for pleading this trivial disagreement as an excuse for her relations, whatever their nature, with her supposed accomplice, the argument was so absurd that her own lawyer manifestly regretted having let her make use of it, and tried several times to cut short her story. But she went on to the end with a kind of hypnotized insistence, as though the scenes she evoked were so real to her that she had forgotten where she was, and imagined herself to be reliving them. At length the judge, who had previously shown a certain kindness to her, said, leaning forward a little, one may suppose, from his row of dozing colleagues, "'Then you would have us believe that you murdered your husband because he would not let you keep a pet dog?' "'I did not murder my husband.' "'Who did, then? Hervé de Longuevin? "'No.' "'Who, then? Can you tell us?' "'Yes, I can tell you. The dogs.' At that point she was carried out of the court in a swoon. It was evident that her lawyer tried to get her to abandon this line of defence. Possibly her explanation, whatever it was, had seemed convincing when she poured it out to him in the heat of their first private colloquy, but now that it was exposed to the cold daylight of judicial scrutiny and the banter of the town, he was thoroughly ashamed of it, and would have sacrificed her without a scruple to save his professional reputation. But the obstinate judge, who, perhaps after all, was more inquisitive than kindly, evidently wanted to hear the story out, and she was ordered the next day to continue her deposition. She said that after the disappearance of the old watchdog nothing particular happened for a month or two. Her husband was much as usual. She did not remember any special incident. But one evening a peddler woman came to the castle and was selling trinkets to the maids. She had no heart for trinkets, but she stood looking on while the women made their choice. And then she did not know how, but the peddler coaxed her into buying for herself a pear-shaped pomander with a strong scent in it. She had once seen something of the kind on a gypsy woman. She had no desire for the pomander, and did not know why she had bought it. The peddler said that whoever wore it had the power to read the future, but she did not really believe that or care much either. However, she bought the thing and took it up to her room, where she sat turning it about in her hand. Then the strange scent attracted her, and she began to wonder what kind of spice was in the box. She opened it and found a grey bean rolled in a strip of paper, and on the paper she saw a sign she knew, and a message from Hervé de Lanrivain, saying that he was at home again, and would be at the door in the court that night after the moon had set. She burned the paper and sat down to think. It was nightfall, and her husband was at home. She had no way of warning Lanrivain, and there was nothing to do but to wait. At this point I fancy the drowsy courtroom beginning to wake up. Even to the oldest hand on the bench there must have been a certain relish in picturing the feelings of a woman on receiving such a message at nightfall from a man living twenty miles away, to whom she had no means of sending a warning. She was not a clever woman, I imagine, and as the first result of her cogitation she appears to have made the mistake of being, that evening, too kind to her husband. She could not ply him with wine, according to the traditional expedient, for though he drank heavily at times, he had a strong head, and when he drank beyond its strength it was because he chose to, and not because a woman coaxed him. Not his wife, at any rate. She was an old story by now. As I read the case, I fancy there was no feeling for her left in him but the hatred occasioned by his supposed dishonour. At any rate, she tried to call up her old graces, but early in the evening he complained of pains and fever, and left the hall to go up to the closet where he sometimes slept. His servant carried him a cup of hot wine, and brought back word that he was sleeping and not to be disturbed, and an hour later, when Anne lifted the tapestry and listened at his door, she heard his loud, regular breathing. She thought it might be a feint, and stayed a long time barefooted in the passage, her ear to the crack, but the breathing went on too steadily and naturally to be other than that of a man in a sound sleep. 
She crept back to her room, reassured, and stood in the window watching the moon set through the trees of the park. The sky was misty and starless, and after the moon went down the night was black as pitch. She knew the time had come, and stole along the passage, past her husband's door, where she stopped again to listen to his breathing, to the top of the stairs. There she paused a moment, and assured herself that no one was following her, then she began to go down the stairs in the darkness. They were so steep and winding that she had to go very slowly for fear of stumbling. Her one thought was to get the door unbolted, tell L'Enrivain to make his escape, and hasten back to her room. She had tried the bolt earlier in the evening, and managed to put a little grease on it, but nevertheless, when she drew it, it gave a squeak, not loud, but it made her heart stop, and the next minute, overhead, she heard a noise. "'What noise?' the prosecution interposed. "'My husband's voice calling out my name and cursing me.' "'What did you hear after that?' "'A terrible scream and a fall.' "'Where was Hervé de Lorivain at this time?' He was standing outside in the court. I just made him out in the darkness. I told him, for God's sake, to go, and then I pushed the door shut. What did you do next? I stood at the foot of the stairs and listened. What did you hear? I heard dogs snarling and panting. Visible discouragement of the bench, boredom of the public, and exasperation of the lawyer for the defence. Dogs again but the inquisitive judge insisted. What dogs? She bent her head and spoke so low that she had to be told to repeat her answer. I don't know. How do you mean you don't know? I don't know what dogs. The judge again intervened. Try to tell us exactly what happened. How long did you remain at the foot of the stairs? Only a few minutes. And what was going on, meanwhile, overhead? The dogs kept on, snarling and panting. Once or twice he cried out. I think he moaned. Then he was quiet. Then what happened? Then I heard a sound like the noise of a pack when the wolf is thrown to them, gulping and lapping. There was a groan of disgust and repulsion through the court, and another attempted intervention by the distracted lawyer but the inquisitive judge was still inquisitive. And all the while you did not go up? Yes, I went up then, to drive them off. The dogs? Yes. Well? When I got there it was quite dark. I found my husband's flint and steel and struck a spark. I saw him lying there. He was dead. And the dogs? The dogs were gone. Gone? Where to? I don't know. There was no way out, and there were no dogs at Kerfol. She straightened herself to her full height, threw her arms above her head, and fell down on the stone floor with a long scream. There was a moment of confusion in the courtroom. Someone on the bench was heard to say, This is clearly a case for the ecclesiastical authorities, and the prisoner's lawyer doubtless jumped at the suggestion. After this the trial loses itself in a maze of cross-questioning and squabbling. Every witness who was called corroborated Anne de Cornot's statement that there were no dogs at Kerfol, had been none for several months. The master of the house had taken a dislike to dogs, there was no denying it, but on the other hand, at the inquest there had been long and bitter discussions as to the nature of the dead man's wounds. One of the surgeons called in had spoken of marks that looked like bites. The suggestion of witchcraft was revived, and the opposing lawyers hurled tomes of necromancy at each other. At last Anne de Cornault was brought back into court, at the insistence of the same judge, and asked if she knew where the dogs she spoke of could have come from. On the body of her Redeemer she swore that she did not. Then the judge put his final question. If the dogs you think you heard had been known to you, do you think you would have recognized them by their barking? Yes. Did you recognize them? Yes. What dogs do you take them to have been? My dead dogs, she said in a whisper. She was taken out of court, not to reappear there again. There was some kind of ecclesiastical investigation, 
and the end of the business was that the judges disagreed with each other and with the ecclesiastical committee, and that Anne de Corneau was finally handed over to the keeping of her husband's family, who shut her up in the keep of Kerfol, where she is said to have died many years later, a harmless madwoman. So ends her story. As for that of Hervé de Lanrivain, I had only to apply to his collateral descendant for its subsequent details. The evidence against the young man being insufficient, and his family influence in the duchy considerable, he was set free and left soon afterward for Paris. He was probably in no mood for a worldly life, and he appears to have come almost immediately under the influence of the famous Monsieur Arnaud d'Andilly and the gentleman of Port Royal. A year or two later he was received into their order, and without achieving any particular distinction, he followed its good and evil fortunes till his death some twenty years later. Lanrivain showed me a portrait of him by a pupil of Philippe de Champagne, sad eyes, an impulsive mouth, and a narrow brow. Poor Hervé de Lanrivain! It was a grey ending. Yet as I looked at his stiff and sallow effigy in the dark dress of the Jansenists, I almost found myself envying his fate. After all, in the course of his life two great things had happened to him. He had loved romantically, and he must have talked with Pascal.'